Okay. Dr. Neurozain, I was saying you will have to tell me something about this music. It's very interesting. And I actually hear a little bit of take five with the piano. And I know you're a musicologist. You must tell me about this. It's a beautiful piece. I love it. <laughs> Dear friends, let me welcome all of you here today for the launch of Dr. Nurisane's recently published book, Made in Ethiopia, a memoir. It is described as a historical and cultural journey through the standout moments in the history of Ethiopia, and in fact, some of the iconic moments in world's history as well. This journey takes us from a barefoot boy back in his hometown through Yugoslavia, where he went to college, back to Ethiopia, his time in the, in the military as a doctor, and his migration to the United States and all the experiences he, ex he encountered. Personally, I'm proud of Dr. Nurusain and what he has accomplished. I'm proud to be one of his friends and with him to be part of what we call the Musketeers, which would include Dr. Judy Kuryansky, Ambassador Y, Dr. Murisain, and myself. And that's because we have been working together for several years now on projects that are close to our hearts. However, I'm not here to be a speaker, just to moderate this, the proceedings and to let it flow. We have a number of outstanding and accomplished individuals who will be speaking including the children who are making their mark in this country. We will have some speeches, some video, video presentation, one of his life since pre-retirement and one pre-retirement and one since and a video message from one of his friends. We will have readings of excerpts of the book by his children who will reminisce on the special moments they enjoyed with him. 
After, we will have a panel discussion where some of his colleagues will tell him of their favorite paragraphs in the book and talk to him about them. I'd also like you to know that you may submit questions in the chat box, which we will forward to the panel for comments. The publisher of the book is also here, and he will have the opportunity to tell you how to purchase the book. However, I have said enough, and it's now time to get on with the program. The first speaker today is Dr. Bereke Hapte Selassie. He's a professor of Africana and Afro-American studies at the University of North Carolina. He's described further as a leading scholar of African law and government. He has held numerous high level positions in the Ethiopian government, such as Attorney General, Associate Justice of Ethiopia's Supreme Court, Vice Minister of the Interior, and Mayor of Hadar. However, he did resign from the government in 64 because of policies he was not entirely happy with. And then after Eritrea gained its independence, Dr. Berkett is the person who wrote their constitution. He has served as a senior advisor on constitutional reform in the DRC, in Nigeria, and Iraq, amongst others. Dr. Berkett might very well be the last living person to have rubbed shoulders with icons like Nkrumah, Lumumba, and others who led Africa, African countries into independence. It's an honor of mine just to introduce him, and I feel that through him, we are connected to the history of our past. Dr. Berkett, it is now your turn to speak. Dr. Berkett, please go ahead. Maura, will you put up his photo? Dr. Berkett, your time. How oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, my brother Gordon, for that uh, wonderful introduction. <laughs> I am actually a retired emeritus professor. I no longer teach. <laughs> I have retired now for almost uh, four years, uh, but I'm still connected with the University of North Carolina. I live in Chapel Hill, not far from the university where I taught. Uh, it is my pleasure, my great honor, to speak about my friend, Dr. Mohammed Turbatain, whom I call as my Muslim brother. Now, when I say that, some people misinterpret as saying that, well, are you members of the Muslim Brotherhood? Uh, no, we are not. But he is my Muslim brother. I am a Christian and he's a Muslim, but he's my brother. The first time I met Dr. Mohammed was in Harar when I was a mayor, a mayor of Harar, I was actually an exiled mayor, mayor, mayor of Harar. Uh, one of the most fascinating works of the way Ethiopian uh, kings used uh, when they demote people, they appoint them. Uh, when, they, when people grow out of grace, they are demoted through appointment to distant places, and that happened to me. But it was a great pleasure, a great honor to serve the city, historic city of Harar. When I met uh, Mohammed, he had just arrived from Yugoslavia, where he did his medical training. I, I didn't know him then. We were just sitting at the Harar Hotel, the, the uh, Ras Hotel in Harar, uh, having coffee. And uh, he heard me speak to Grinya, who another uh, person, and then he said to me, oh, you are Tigrinya speaker? I said, yes. And then we started speaking in Tigrinya, our uh, mother tongue. Uh, but of course, we also spoke Amharic and English, of course. I asked him where he came from, what he does, and then he told me his story. From then on, our friendship took off. I took an instant liking of Mohammed, his sense of humor, his humility, his uh, incredible intelligence and wit. And uh, ever since then, I wondered when, especially when I heard more about his life, when he would put things to writing, saying something about his life. 
it was therefore a great pleasure and honor that I decided when I was asked to write a foreword for his uh, book, Born in Ethiopia. Uh, let me, by the way, <laughs> make a confession that there is a, a small error, not a small error, but quite an error in the foreword I wrote for the book. I call the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Dr. Uh, Abi Ahmed, uh, a Muslim. Although he is uh, born and brought up in a Muslim uh, household, uh, he actually became Christian later on. So he is a Christian. Uh, I hope that in the next edition of the book, that mistake will be, will be corrected. Anyway, uh, the book, uh, as I said, uh, reflects the uh, interesting and fascinating, if somewhat tragic, uh, place of Muslims, uh, Ethiopians. People who love their country, as you see in the, the title of the book, is Born in, uh, in Ethiopia. It shows uh, how much attached uh, he is to his birthplace. Uh, he's a proud citizen, but the sense of alienation and the sense of a nagging feeling that he did not belong, that he was regarded as a second class citizen, followed him like a shadow, as I said in the book, in the uh, forward, throughout his life, in a country that he clearly uh, loved. Uh, and uh, I end the book uh, uh, by saying that it's an important contribution it will be an important contribution towards understanding the place of Islam and Muslim citizens in Ethiopia in these troubled times when everything is questioned. Uh, in my foreword, I, I give a kind of historical uh, context to the book uh, and try to explain the reason why Many Muslims, including my friend Muhammad, have felt a sense of alienation throughout their lives. The reason is that Ethiopia has been, for much of its history, a Christian kingdom. And until recently, uh, the head of, the, of, the, of Ethiopia was a king, king, the last king being Emperor Haile Selassie, who was not only emperor and king, but also defender of the faith the faith being the Christian Orthodox Church of Ethiopia. In that kind of context, of course, the place of Muslims was uh, problematic. That's the word, I think, perhaps a more uh, uh, wise way of putting it. It was more problematic. Muslim Ethiopians from every part of Ethiopia believed that they were citizens, even though they had this problem of not being uh, accepted uh, in a full measure as citizens of their country. Uh, there has been tremendous change since the last, in the last 30 years, in which Ethiopian Muslims have been accepted as full citizens. Uh, Islamic holidays have been accepted as uh, official holidays, uh, and so on and so forth. So things have changed indeed, very much. Uh, it is in that sense that I feel that uh, Muhammad's uh, book will provide some kind of uh, uh, contribution in a mutual understanding among Ethiopians, Christians and Muslims. Now, when, when the reading uh, part portion of this program begins, some people may uh, use extracts from the book uh, to illustrate uh, some aspects of it. I don't think I need to go into that. Anybody who, uh, who wants uh, to uh, find what I call the historical context for Ethiopia's Muslims to read, find the reason why they feel alienated, uh, they can read the foreword uh, of the book. And then the rest can come during question time. I think I'll stop here, Gordon. Yes. And thank you. And I, I welcome the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burkett. Uh, you've you left us with um, a few nuggets. For instance, 
by telling us that um, Dr. Mohammed felt a sense of not belonging um, at home. I think that explains why he's such a champion for human rights and, and um, humanitarian efforts. I recall he led a mission or he led a delegation to the High Commissioner for Human Rights at the United Nations um, several years ago after writing a letter to, to him, to the Secretary General at the time and to, I, I can't recall who was the ambassador of the country that was involved. I won't mention that, but um, he has done that. He has written letters to the editor. He has published in the Black Star News about injustices and about oppression of people um, and Ethiopians in different countries all over the world. It explains that. Thank you for that. I know you have much more to say on so many other subjects, but we will um, hold it there. And now we we'll turn to the man of the hour so that in greet, he can greet his, um, I should call them admirers and fans and book lovers as well. And there's no need to elaborate on your great intellect, your expansive knowledge of world history. And in case you all do not know, his encyclopedic knowledge of all different music forms. Dr. Newersane, I invite you to take the mic, but remember, this is, not, this is only a brief greeting. You will have ample time to say a lot of things afterwards. Please go ahead. <laughs> now, unmute. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome all these wonderful friends and well-wishers that are, um, you know, tuning in to this uh, event. And thank you, Gordon, um, Pan-Africanist par excellence, man from Jamaica, a good friend of mine and partner in crime in um, promoting Africa and people of African descent everywhere. Uh, thank you. And uh, I'm particularly grateful to uh, my good friend. Um, actually, I feel privileged. Uh, the warm introduction that uh, the preeminent scholar of African history and uh, constitutional law, my mentor and uh, longtime friend, distinguished professor, Barakat Abdel Salasi. Uh, uh, basically, people might wonder, why do I choose to write a memoir? Uh, what possible benefit can the life of this simple immigrant uh, provide? Um, it's a valid question. Uh, it's just a personal reason for myself to uh, let my children and uh, children of Ethiopians of my generation uh, to know a little bit about the uh, pre-revolutionary Ethiopia and what Ethiopia has gone through in the meantime. Uh, it indeed has undergone one major and two other smaller revolutions during my lifetime uh, that have transformed the country in my lifetime. I write about being alienated growing up, uh, search for identity growing up a Muslim in an or officially Christian state. Um, I also write about love of books and the military training at the Haile Selassie Military Academy uh, that helped me uh, actualize myself. I, I then talk about my time in Yugoslavia where I went to medical school, my experiences there, a little bit about the Ethiopian uh, students movement that um, rocked the millennial old monarchy uh, then coming back to Ethiopia, serving as a military doctor from my uh, from uh, Yugoslavia, and then uh, eventually ending up uh, in the United States, coming for residency, uh, but 
uh, being forced to stay, agonizing over the decision to seek asylum following the murder of my brother by the military regime that had hijacked the revolution in Ethiopia. Uh, you, might, you might say this memoir is really sort of a love letter to the country of my birth. Um, and, um, and thank you all for coming. Having said that, I would like to give you a little bit of flavor of, uh, uh, perhaps let me start with my early childhood. Uh, when I was seven years old, uh, I was actually living with my mother and my two sisters after our father died some four years earlier. And then I had to move to Gondor with my uncle, uh, uh, Tahir Hagos, who uh, was seeking better business opportunities there. So I will give you just a flavor of the uh, uh, way we traveled uh, from uh, place to place at that time. There was no, there were no good roads really, and there was no bus service. So uh, what we did was um, uh, going on some uh, truck. Uh, that's what I'm describing here. I'm reading from the book. The trip from Adwa to Gondor was grueling. There was no bus service in those days. The roads built by Italian army engineers connecting Eritrea with Gondor during the war were built in record time to facilitate the um, movement of troops and equipment as they advanced farther inland from Eritrea. It was a gravel road asphalted in some uh, sections. By the 1950s, however, the roads were in disrepair. Most of the asphalt and gravel were gone, leaving a dusty and uneven surface, which only the large Italian trucks could navigate with a great deal of difficulty. The Haji Abdul family owned a fleet of Fiat Trenta Quattro trucks. I was entrusted to the care of Wadi Alek, a driver of one of, the, of those trucks, to take me to Gondor. Adults, adult passengers usually found uh, a spot on, on top of the truck, you know, uh, with the cargo. In my case, however, Wadi Alek sat me in the gabina, the front cabin, alongside him. The 400 kilometer stretch from Adwa to Gondor often took three days. The roads would be muddy, sticky, and slippery after the rain. The Adwa Gondor route goes through unforgiving malaria infested terrain in the Tekeza Valley, crossing a steel bridge over the mighty Tekeza River before the road begins a steep ascent along a treacherous, narrow, and winding road known as Limalimo, bordered by rocky mountains on one side and a deep ravine on the other. Near the top of the ascent was a large stone monument with names of Italian army officers and the hundreds of soldiers and Ethiopian laborers who died building the road which required the use of dynamite to blast off parts of the mountain to make way for road construction. The caption on the monument says, non sono morti in vano, meaning they did not die in vain. So this Dr. is the kind Nourishin. of world that existed at the time. Uh, Dr. Nuresing, yeah. you are giving us the piece de resistance before we have begun the meal. <laughs> <laughs> so I want you to save some of your, your um, reading for the excerpts for later in the program. Okay. So a good sample of what is to come. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I now wish to introduce United Nations Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs, Dr. Tai Brook Zerihun. ASG Zerihun is someone who has spent many years building peace and stability in different quarters of the world as Special Representative of the Secretary General in Cyprus and head of peacekeeping as well. And he has also served a similar role in, in Sudan. Yes, of course, he's Ethiopian. And he has an interesting story to tell about Dr. New Hussein. Um, SG Zerhun, I give you the floor. Please, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we hear you, Red. Well, my greetings to, to all, and particularly to Nadia, Siham, and Safi, uh, who, uh, to my regret, I have not been able to see as often as I would have loved. But be that as it may, I, I, I am grateful for this opportunity. Um, not so much to make a statement, but to point out some um, of the incredible um, experiences Mohammed and I shared, uh, mostly at the academy, but also since we both found ourselves here in the United States uh, in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, both Mohammed and I, uh, I think to us, a military career was the furthest from our minds. Uh, but as Mohammed has um, eloquently related in his uh, book, neither of us had any choice. So off we went to Harad, more or less screaming and, and scratching. Um, but in retrospect, as Mohammed has noted, um, we were really um, uh, enriched by the experience. I think we both grew up at the academy. I think both of us were not yet 17 when we joined. And it was a life-changing experience. Uh, but also, um, it helped us forge uh, an enduring relationship. And I uh, am grateful uh, for that. Um, somehow, in the early days at uh, the academy, uh, Mohammed and I drew together and, and, and we bonded uh, during our early days at the academy. Uh, we tended to gravitate towards the tail end of the pack uh, when we were out uh enforced marches and endurance training uh we were not slackers as such but i think uh, neither, neither of us had yet fully accepted uh, our place uh, in in the military um, among the experiences uh, we share uh, was the the humbling experience muhammad eloquently relates about number 14. That's the infamous horse. Uh, Mohammed has, has uh, really graphically explained the terror we all faced when we were told to mount that, that horse. I also experienced the same um, uh, uh, unflattering, I would say, experience. Uh, on on uh, horse number fourteen, um, we uh, we both think were um, alerted uh, to the dangers of riding that horse, but but somehow we I certainly didn't pay heed. I thought I could do it, but my fate was no different than Mohammed's. Um, but I must admit that I was really surprised flabbergasted uh, by uh, Mohammed's memory of events, uh, of personalities, of dates, uh, and the, the few shenanigans uh, we traversed uh, uh, well over six uh, decades ago. Uh, he told me he never kept a diary or a journal um, of those uh, heady days, certainly at the academy, where to me the details, uh, even after he has related them, still are a bit fuzzy. Uh, but I really thank him for uh, bringing back those, those memories and, in a way, reliving them, as I have done when I read his book. Um, I have known about a few people really who are as kind-hearted hearted and as focused and sincere as Muhammad. 
Uh, he has been a lifelong friend and I cherish that. Um, and so has his family. And, and, and uh, uh, he has been a loving, doting father and husband and an incredibly uh, um, good friend to all, to all of us. Um, he is a family man. Uh, he has always excelled himself in being close to his children, uh, who are no less children than, than uh, to us than, than to him. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, time has been cruel, and uh, they are, and Nadia is on the other end of the continent. Uh, I think I have probably seen Siham a little more. Uh, by some circumstances, including in Cyprus, if I recall. Um, and, and, uh, and what of the, the Troika, really? Uh, Siham and Nadia and Mohammed and uh, Safi, they have been incredible uh, children. They have achieved much and much more uh, to come. Um, if Mohammed doesn't mind sharing the limelight a bit, uh, I would like to, to say um, uh, uh, a little bit about Nadia's book, which, by the way, Mohammed, I ask you to put the book right side up. It's behind you. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed your book, Nadia. I think I read it. Thank you. No? <coughs> That's better. Okay. I read it at ago, and I read he, your father and your book back to back, and what, what a do, do. Really, I uh, want too much. Uh, I, uh, um, uh, Mohammed. Yes. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. And I just want to say also, uh, it's, it's such a pleasure to see you. And um, the book, my book is really dedicated to my father. Really, he is the reason the book was written. So, so I'll, I'll put the focus back on him. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as I said, I'm not here to make a statement, but to just recollect some, some uh, uh, experiences I have shared with Mohammed. Uh, I want to thank him really for the friendship, uh, for the memories. Uh, which have lasted um, a lifetime now. And, and thank you, <clears throat> a wonderful book, uh, which has made it possible for me to relieve some of our fondest memories. I can't, I crave for the, for the uh, sequel. So on with it, Dr. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Zerifon. Um, it's our experience too that he is a faithful friend, a very good friend, and we are so much aware of the love for his family, how proud he is of his daughters and son, of their accomplishments. He is ecstatic about the book that um, Sihan wrote, and I, uh, Nadia wrote, and he, he has mentioned um, um, at least a dozen occasions. Did you know that she is listed for the for an award? Mm -hmm. For the book is listed for an award? He has said <laughs> maybe a dozen times. But um, we are wishing you well <laughs> with this Nadia. <laughs> we hope you win the award. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I indulge you for one minute. I think it would be remiss on my part if I didn't recall Zahra, wonderful soul. You all knew and loved, kind hearted, generous <coughs> person, graceful, who loved her family and loved us all. And I cherish her memory. And I, like her children and her husband, feel lucky to have known her for the time we did. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Shimulis Gulema. He's Professor of Africana Studies at Stony Brook University in New York State, specializing in modern and com contemporary Africa, the African diaspora, 
urbanization, political economy, governance, development, and the politics of knowledge. He's also an author who has published books about Africa in general and on Ethiopia. Dr. Shimulus went to UCLA when he arrived in the USA, and it is there that his interest in race and being black struck a chord with him. As he said in an interview that I read, interestingly, he said, generally in Africa, people do not talk about race. There are people who didn't even know they were black until they moved to a predominantly white country because black, white is not in the daily dialogue. I would love to have Dr. Shimulis talk on this very subject at some point in the future. But let me get on with the program. Dr. Shimulis, it is now your turn at the podium. Please, the mic is yours. Okay. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, let me start uh, by uh, congratulating Dr. Mohammed and his children and family. Um, I also uh, uh, take, take this moment to thank uh, uh, Dr. Nadia for a wonderful book, a book that I use regularly in my class on Africa and uh, Ethiopia. Also, uh, it's, a, it's a great book and uh, I hope you would win the award. Um, let me also express my deep gratitude to Dr. Mohammed for his humility generosity uh, of spirit, his profound knowledge, which he shares with joy for a life he lived well, examined with meaning and a profound impact. Let me also thank all those involved in organizing this event in the celebration of the life and works of Dr. Mohammed. I am very privileged to have been given the opportunity to say a few words about his book, Made in Ethiopia. Made in Ethiopia is a book that offers a compelling account of the life and times of Dr. Mohammed Hussein, both at home and beyond. The book is part of a growing tradition of autobiographical writing in Ethiopia, a tradition that is generating a wealth of information, not just about the lives and experience of individuals, but also of communities, nations, and the world. By writing such a fascinating work, Dr. Muhammad achieved the enviable to write a deeply engaging yet immensely complicated story of Ethiopia and of this world by telling a personal story that is exceedingly arresting. In this connection, I can say, one can cite an enduring merit of a work like Dr. Muhammad's. One is the ability to reclaim the right or agency to tell one's own stories as objectively as possible, but also the ability to offer alternative, more often deeply personal accounts of significant events, this country, one dimensional, often state sanctioned, and uh, usually simplistic and oppressive narratives. There is one example that I can cite here, where, and uh, an example that is uh, present in the book. For instance, Ethiopia's official story of the, the state is a story of embrace, of a state accepting or without distinction. Such a narrative, which is deeply entrenched in the institutions, ideologies, cultures, even language of the Ethiopian state, can see another profound story, another narrative, which I consider to be very important. A story of state ambivalence, a story in which the state which claims to embrace actually engage in an act of simultaneous inclusion and exclusion while enforcing hierarchs of citizens and citizenship on the basis of class, religion, and now ethnicity. So the, so the book is important in this sense, in, a, in this uh, telling of a story that we don't usually hear. In the interest of time, I only mention a few observations that I found to be critical to the making of the man we celebrate today. One is what I like to call his triangular experiences, the Ethiopian, uh, which is a profoundly conservative country, the East European, uh, especially at a time of uh, uh, left uh, revolutionary radical experience, and the US. In a way, Dr. Mohammed's story of growing up in the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s is a story of his Ethiopia a proud yet Azerized country trying to navigate 
survive in a violently bipolar Cold War world. A world in which Dr. Mohammed, like his country, Ethiopia, was simultaneously fascinated and terrified by the US and by the USSR. This in betweenity, uh, this ambivalence uh, is a condition that he, like his country, had to live with and deal with. This story brings me to my second point, which tries to which ties to the title of his book, Made in Ethiopia. Although the book is, uh, is titled as such, Made in Ethiopia, Dr. Mahmer can also be seen as a man made as much in Ethiopia as in the world. Even I can add that we can even view Dr. Mohammed as a man more made for rather than made in, as a man made for Ethiopia and made for the world at large. He is a man who, despite his visceral patriotic attachment to his motherland, his country, is shaped by more humanistic internationalist ideas of social justice, human rights. A man in search of a country, but also a world, that is more fair, more free, more equal, more just, and more inclusive. In many ways, Made in Ethiopia can be read as a story of deep connections, of being rooted in the spaces, emotions, and ethos of a country called Ethiopia. But it is also an absorbing account of profound alienation, of leading a life of precarity, which stem out of the complicated experience of being accepted and rejected simultaneously, both in the land he calls home because of his Muslim background, but also in a world that he accepts as home away from home because of his being a black Muslim mother, which has now become a threatening combination. Imagine living a life, living such a life of everyday suspension, not to mention the challenge of navigation between inside and outside, of becoming inside out, of not being here and not being there, of not being anywhere. This is Dr. Mohammed's experience of growing up in Ethiopia, but also of his life in exile, in exile, joining millions who are otherized because of who they are in the country of their origin, but also in those of their destination. In short, this book is a work of immeasurable importance, an engrossing story of a person's life and work, of a country and a world that, you know, that was fast transformed. For me, and I would agree, I would say for many people who read, who read this book, this is a must read book for anyone interested in a story which in a way is our own story. It's a fascinating book. And I thank uh, Dr. Mohammed for right, for bringing this story to us. Uh, I, I expect uh, there will be another book coming out, uh, hopefully soon. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shumales. The one thing you haven't said is how you both um, met each other. I suspect that there is a bit of a age difference where I cannot naturally say, mm, they went to medical school together, or they mm. were in the school together, or they practice at um, Down Street Medical Center together. It would be interesting. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will leave that. <laughs> Our next speaker is one of the... Um, is the there Muslim an answer? Hello? Is there an answer? No, there's no answer. And maybe we don't have to get that answer. <laughs> so, is there an answer? <laughs> it, we, we'll have to we find out here. about that. We'll have to find out about that. <laughs> But let us proceed. <laughs> Our next speaker is one of the musketeers. Um, and again, I will remind you that the musketeers was uh, Dr. Nurusain, uh, Ambassador Y, um, Dr. Judy, and myself. Um, Dr. Nurusain, because of his military service, was a D'Artagnan of the group. <laughs> so <laughs> we didn't know that he. He wasn't volunteering to go at the front of the park. <laughs> anyway, um, the next speaker has been a close friend and confidant of Dr. Nur Hussein and a former president of the United Afghan Congress. 
He's a most remarkable individual who mixes charisma with compassion. He's able to attract all kinds of people to him and, and being willing to assist all who are in need. He's what one would call an ideas man who is constantly thinking about how he can improve the lives of the needy, especially from his native country, Sierra Leone, from the continent of Africa, and Africans in the diaspora. He was the first African to run for a citywide office in New York. Yes, he lost, but he gained significant support, paving the way for other sons of Africa to take a seat at the table. He was also seen advisor to a series of police, um, police commissioners in New York City and a key person in resolving controversial matters so as to calm volatile situations. I could go on, but I won't. His Excellency Sadiq Abubakawai, Ambassador of Sierra Leone to the United States of America. Ambassador Wai, I call you to the microphone. Thank you. Thank you, my most distinguished uh, successor, uh, 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 Mr. Gordon Tapper. Uh, I want to start by also recognizing our esteemed elder and statesman, Dr. Berakat Selassie. Um, Excellency Tai, for the wonderful work you're doing at the UN, uh, Professor Shimless, and perhaps the foremost Pan-Africanist that we know in the United States of America, Professor Dr. Ron Daniels, the Dr. Nurosin's children, they didn't know that I was adopted in that family also. Thank you. And um, there yeah, are several of my ambassadorial colleagues uh, from the African Diplomatic Corps that are on this call. I won't name them all, but they are here. I say welcome to my colleagues. And Sierra Leone's uh, first Consular General uh, to the Embassy to Miami, Honorable George Hamilton is on the score. And of course, my distinguished home and comrades, Dr. Judy Koransky, Gordon Tapa, Milton Alamadi, and of course, Africa's spokesperson when it comes to media, uh, Mr. Mamadi Yang. If I left everybody out, please forgive me. I did not want to talk about the book because if I talk about the book, people, we feel, well, he's already talked about the book, so we're not gonna buy it. So I'm going to leave those important details that will make you go to the publisher to buy it. And let me just say this. Some people came to visit me here today, and guess what? They didn't even read the book, but they bought 10, they left money for 10 copies of the book because I told them I was buying 10 copies. He says, well, Ambassador, we are matching you. So everybody on this call, Dr. Nuru Sain's book is already moving up the bestseller list with me doing 10 and the money is here for 10 others and there are no, so many people are gonna be doing this. Let me just be a little serious here because it's always important to uh, start from the beginning. I met Dr. Nur Hussain almost a quarter century ago as a radical rebel white coat doctor that was just fed up with the way they, the medical professionals at SUNY Downstate and Kings County Hospital were treating people so I got mad that we used to call me the angry African in the United States because I felt healthcare was a right 
was not a privilege, and he felt that way. But since he was African, and they saw this angry black African, so they went to him to tame me, to calm me down. Little did he know, they know, that he educated me, he gave me, he schooled me, <laughs> he taught me what to say. But they never knew that. So through his effort and through that work we did together, he adopted me. He became my father, he became my doctor, he became my friend, and, I, and he became my mentor. So he literally calmed me down and reshaped me. And for the past several years, many, many years, if I'm sitting here today as an ambassador, I sat on his shoulders as well as many others. So this book, like Dr. Shimon said and Dr. Barakat said, being a Muslim himself, looking at this, this struggle that he had to go through to finding an identity. This book has liberated Dr. Nur Hussain to share his experiences. And I was honored when he asked me to say something in, uh, to write something about his book. So I said, well, Doc, this is not fair. I said, who else is writing? He said, Dr. Barakat is writing. I said, oh my God, then I'm not worthy to be in that uh, category at all. So I prayed to Allah and Allah gave me the opportunity to come up with something simple. And when I showed it to him, he says, oh my God, should I show this to Barakat? I said, please don't. He might want to correct it. <laughs> so he might not make the big but Dr. Nora saying has not only been um, a father, a friend, a leader in this country, but he has been a pioneer in many of the major developments that have happened on the continent of Africa. And yes, Dr. Shimmels, Professor Shimmels was right. He's not only made in Ethiopia, but he's a proud son of Africa that fights not only for people of color, but for the whole race. So this book, I will urge each and every one of us and our friends, our network to purchase it. So I have order here for 10 books. They didn't even read the book. So I have order for my own 10 books. So I have order for 20 books. So since this is, a book launch, I want to predict that this book, by the time it's over, is going to be on the best New York, I mean, the world's best set at least, because we're going to make sure the whole world knows about it. So I don't want to spoil anybody's appetite because Gordon is looking at me and Mamadou and others are telling him, tell him to shut up. So <laughs> I'm going to shut up and listen, but let me congratulate uh, Africa's leader in the Americas and what you have done, not only for me, but for many of us who have looked up to you as not only a friend, but the icon of Africa in the United States. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ambassador Wai. I think um, we will now have a, a, a video uh, presentation of the life and times of Dr. Mohammed. And uh, as we play this video, Dr. Uh, Mohammed will need to do a commentary on what is there. Each slide will be up for like 10 seconds. So he doesn't need to speak about each slide, but the first batch of slides will deal with family. The second batch will deal with him in uh, medical school. The third batch will deal with him in the military. 
And uh, the fourth match will deal with his um, being a doctor in the United States and doing the things that he does. So he can do a summary um, um, commentary on each of those uh, categories. So I think we're ready for that now. More? Okay, uh, Doctor, did you uh, say? Yeah, go ahead. Did I just say, this is a family. This is uh, during my Afro days with my late wife. And uh, these are two families, very close friend of uh, my wife's, Hannah and her children. And this is a family, um, a little bit grown. Uh, now, this is the time when I was an inter well, a student in, in Yugoslavia. And uh, of course, that's the cover of the book. Um, I was honored to be uh, considered among the top physicians. And uh, my school days also in Zagreb. Um, well, on Doctor's Day, that's when they recognize me, kind of. Uh, and uh, it's another one. This is at the military, I mean, at the Brook Army Medical Center, uh, where among a group of uh, allied officers during the Cold War, they were allies of the US. Uh, you can, <coughs> you can uh, say which ones they are. And uh, it's our wedding uh, with the honor guard uh, by my friends. And um, uh, this is uh, with my friend, uh, Dr. Balai, and this is an angry teenager. Uh, growing up there, and uh, graduation in Zagreb well, with well wishers. Um, these are the trio of Zagreb, you know, <laughs> like a dwarf. And uh, this is the fundraising for uh, Gail Brewer uh, um, at the permanent mission of the United Nations of the African Union with uh, the president of Liberia, uh, Sir Lip Johnson. And this is a street scene in Harar. Uh, this among the biggies, um, Dr. Burke and uh, Gary Schultz. This is actually a, a sort of a, a design of the hospital that we, people in American doctors are trying to build. And the last picture is me and my wife uh, in, uh, in a street scene somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that commentary, um, explaining what these uh, photographs uh, are. And uh, you weren't a bad looking guy at all. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that, <laughs> that snapshot. I now call on um, Dr. Ron Daniels. Um, Ron is the president of the Institute of the Black World, 21st century, and convener, convener of the Pan-African Unity Dialogue. He is an avowed and a committed Pan-Africanist who has never tired of fighting for the rights and equality and justice for people of color, not only in America, but all around the world, including Haiti, that he really does have a uh, special um, affinity for. And with that, I would like to call um, Dr. Ron Daniels to the stage. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, protocol having been established by one of the musketeers, uh, the Honorable uh, Sadiq Abubakar Y. I don't have to necessarily then um, sort of uh, go through the protocol of mentioning everyone. And of course, I, I'm watching you as you are um, uh, you, you now not kind of know how I feel as the moderator of the Pan-African Unity Dialogue attempting to keep everybody on time. It's a very difficult task. It is. <laughs> Let me just say that, um, uh, first of all, uh, uh, I, I, I really was anxious about this because I have a number of commitments. I had to leave just a minute ago to take care of some business and I, I really have two or three other major commitments I have to take care of today particularly since the Institute of the Black World 21st Century by way of the National African-American Reparations Commission is literally at the center and the forefront 
of the U.S. and the global reparations movement. And there are two programs that we're working on this evening and one tomorrow, which some of you may have seen that I have to prepare for. And so I'm really up against the clock and will not therefore be able to stay for the duration of the program. Let me first of all congratulate again um, our esteemed uh, chairman, uh, Dr. Mohammed Nurasan. Uh, I already have purchased my copy of the book. Uh, and of course, at the Pan-African Unity Dialogue, we urge everyone to purchase a copy. Uh, the thing I want to remark about is, and this is always the case, it seems, uh, this book is, is, this memoir is a remarkable story behind, uh, the, again, the esteemed chairman of the influential United, the United Africa Congress, which is an inc incredibly powerful organization. And it is a founding member of the Pan-African Unity Dialogue. Hence, we know that Dr. Nuasan is a committed Pan-Africanist and also champion of human rights. And this is always illustrated by the conversations that we have within the Pan-African Unity Dialogue in the four meetings that we have uh, each, um, each year. I've not had the privilege of working with him, uh, you know, like 25 years, but I've seen him in action over the last decade or so. But what happens is you re we never really know. You, you could sit there and work with someone, but you never really know their story. And I'm always interested in getting at people's stories. When I do my interviews on WBAI, people launch off and I say, no, 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 who are you? And one of the things that I found, it was very moving when we asked Dr. Nuerson, as we would have to do, given his stature and his standing and the work, work that he's done, to premiere at least his book at the Pan-African Unity Dialogue. It was moving to hear his testimony, his story of who he is, what he's gone through, his trials, tribulations, and triumphs, the resiliency and the commitment, particularly in the context of a country that he loves, but a country which, given the fact that he's a Muslim and the whole notion that was talked about earlier in terms of of Haile Selassie being the defender of the faith and essentially being a, I mean, these are very, very difficult questions to navigate. And yet our chairman has navigated those, uh, those difficult, uh, those difficult uh, circumstances. And so it revealed to me an untold story of an untold visionary. And by that, I mean, very often we have walking among us, people who are just walking among us who are incredible human beings. It is often said that the history of the world is not necessarily made by the more notable names. It is ordinary people who do extraordinary things. And this is what we see in the life and legacy of Muhammad Nurasain. And so I think at the end of the day, his life and legacy will inspire, this is the importance of this book, it will inspire numbers in the generations to come, to this generation and generations to come. Already we are hearing about its impact. And that's so important because very often those of us who have gone through these trials and tribulations, don't, it's painful. So we don't necessarily want to share it with our sons and our daughters because it was painful. But in the tradition of my offer that Reverend Johnny Young, Ray Youngblood has talked about in terms of the African Holocaust, we cannot really go to the future unless we look back. And so it's, it's looking back and it's going through that journey of what it is, the trials and tribulations that really points to the future and gives us a sense that we must be committed to Pan-Africanism. We must be committed to human rights, no matter the cost. And Mohammed Nurassan has paid the cost because he had to leave his country you know, given the fact that his, 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 his brother was killed uh, in, the, in the course of his, his life as a authentic revolutionary. And so this is a powerful and important book. And again, it will inspire generations to come. I think it is appropriately labeled a love letter to his country. And that's important. But it is also a love letter to his daughters and to his family, because very often, they go through this journey. And for him to pen it in that way, it seems to me is really moving because they now have his testimony in a way that includes them and talks about his legacy. So I can only say, Mr. Chairman, you are our STEAM leader. We know that you ain't no ways tired as we say in the Black Freedom Struggle. So a luta continua, a luta continua, the struggle continues. Thank you very much. Thank you, my friend. 
Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Um, very well said. The struggle continues. Um, I would now like us to, to go to a video from one of Dr. Neurostein's very close friends, um, Sherwin Wills from New York One. She's an author herself, and um, she's not able to be here as she is broadcasting on New York One at the moment. But she has a video that I would like um, to play, giving support to Dr. Nursein and uh, his, 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 his book, which is very much success. Hello, Dr. Nur Hussein. I want to say congratulations on your new book. I am home alone. I've been working from home here. This is a New York One studio here in my living room in Long Island. But I want to say to you, I love your book about your many accomplishments from Ethiopia to the United States and indeed around the world. This is an important book. And I want to tell you from one author to another, I'm so proud of you. I am so proud of you. And my deepest regret is that I cannot be with you because of work commitments. I am working from home harder than I've ever worked before. But please continue to do the excellent work that you've been doing, Dr. Nur Hussein. You have made the world a better place. And I'm glad that you've documented it inside this amazing book. Wishing you and all of my friends with the Congress the very best. Thanks again and good luck. And I hope it gets to the top of the New York Times bestseller list. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, I hope you are on this program um, listening uh, having one eye in the program while you're doing your broadcast. We should have uh, had the, the publisher um, of Africa World Press Books. I don't know if he is on at the moment, but I will pick up from where Ambassador Y left off. I want to encourage you all to purchase this book and purchase a book for your friend. You can order it at, and please take this down, www.africawordpressbooks.com. I will repeat, www.africawordpressbooks.com. I will spell Africa as in Africa. World as in world, press as in press, and books. It's easier to, to pronounce it like that rather than spell it. So, dot com. So please um, place your order for this book. It's $34. And um, if enough of us purchase the book, we will get a, a discount of, of $20. The publisher had asked me to say that when you order it, when you click on this link, you will have a little box there that you should say, I would like to have an autographed copy of the book. I want to have the book signed by Dr. Nurusain. Dr. Nurusain has agreed that at some point he will drive down to Trenton, New Jersey, where the, the publisher is, he will sign these books and the publisher will mail them out to you. Um, we will put up this information in the chat box as well, so you can all see what it is. And those of you who are interested, um, and it should be all of you who are interested, please put your email address into the chat box. In fact, whether you do that or not, as long as you're on the call, you will receive an email with the, with the link so you can go right ahead and order. Order it for yourself and order for your friend. Okay? All right. Well, 
um, we will move on from here. We're now going to go into the second segment of our program, which we call Expressions from the Family, because his uh, children, Nadia, Siham, and Safi, will read excerpts from the book, which bring back fond memories of their life together, growing up, and even as adults, where he still remains the doting, proud father. So, um, I would like to call Nadia, Siham, and Safi to the microphone. If we could put them up on the screen, in the, have them all up on the screen at the same time, that would be very good, with Dr. Nurusain. Okay, thank you, Gordon. Um, thank you uh, for organizing this. Um, it's uh, my honor to um, introduce my father to read from the book, but before we do that, um, I will, um, along with my sister and brother, read um, excerpts from the book that struck us. Um, I'll start with my excerpt that I wanted to read and then I'll say a few words about it. Um, this is early in the book. It is from a chapter called Ancestors and it's just a few paragraphs at the end of the chapter that I want to read. After walking a little further up the hill in the village, my cousin Muhammad Burhan led us to the burial ground of our grandfathers and great grandfathers. It was a deeply emotional moment to come face to face with the land where our ancestors were laid to rest. The graves lacked markers. Cousin Muhammad Burhan, who had established a relationship with the village elders in Gure, talked to them about our plans to fence off the burial ground and eventually succeeded in reaching an accommodation with them after a long discussion. Neglected over time with an overgrowth of grass and shrubs, it had become a grazing ground for the cows and goats of the village. We cleared the brush at the grave site, roasted and brewed coffee the Ethiopian way, broke bread, and prayed with recitations of the important chapters of the, in the Quran, Yasin and Tiberic, along with prayers for the dead and al fatiha led by cousin Mustafa. As we walked through the village, Uncle Daher stopped several passers-by to ask about prominent people he had known as a child. He would ask questions like, how is Mbete, Mbete Salas, Balambares Wildeslasi? How about Aite Kase? I may be mispronouncing those. <laughs> the village people had no clue as to the people my uncle was talking about. He would point to where they used to live and who their kids were. Once in a while, an elderly priest or farmer would recognize their grandchildren and tell my uncle the parents and grandparents were long gone. He would hear the bad news over and over again. Uncle Taha didn't seem to realize that the men and women of his childhood would have been well past a hundred by now. One farmer who looked older than my uncle remembered where our grandfather and the other Muslims used to live and was bemoaning the fact that Gure had gone into economic decline after the Muslim merchants left. He was happy to see us. There are no Muslim families left in the village now. So one of the reasons why I wanted to read that passage is because even though it's not um, directly about my father's childhood, it seemed to me to capture the tone of the book, which was a kind of um, bittersweet feeling of nostalgia in a kind of um, the real um, etymological sense, you know, of nostalgia um, uh, being a pain of homecoming. The, the, the feeling of um, uh, not really, you know, to, to, to you know, use an expression that you may be familiar to be able to go home again, right? So, um, this, uh, this feeling that he talks about with, um, his, with Uncle Tahir going there and expecting to find what he left behind and not finding that seemed to me a thread that ran throughout the book as a lot of people have talked about already today, um, this feeling of um, belonging and yet not belonging, 
feeling like you're home and you're not home at the same time. So um, that, like I said, felt like a kind of microcosm of the book's whole message to me. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my brother and sister may already may talk about this also, but um, there was a lot in the book that we didn't know as children. There were a lot of things we knew, but there were a lot of things we didn't know. And if you know my father, you know that he is a very good natured, um, you know, uh, uh, optimistic kind of guy. And um, to know about a lot of the pain that he's experienced um, in his life um, that, we, that he never really shared openly with us, um, it was uh, very eye-opening. And so um, with that, I'm gonna just pass things along to my sister, Siham. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Siham, I'm the middle child. Um, it's great to see so many friends and family here, um, you know, just coming together to celebrate the, the launch of my dad's book. Um, you know, I, of course, love the memoir, and um, there, there are a number of stories that, um, from the memoir that, that we did hear growing up, um, as well as, like Nadia noted, several that were brand new to us. Um, but there's one in particular from his childhood that just always stuck with me um, and that I just remember being both like fascinated and, and sort of horrified by. And that's um, a very vivid memory that he shares in a chapter called The Dog Bite and a Lifetime of Phobia. Um, so I just want to share a very brief excerpt from, from that chapter. Halfway down the dirt road, I was going past a pack of stray dogs fighting over a piece of bone when one of them, a big dark brown dog that looked like a wolf whose picture I saw in a geography book, jumped out of the pack and I saw him running toward me with menacing fangs ready to tear me to pieces. I was seized with a paralyzing fear. Sure enough, the dog, a giant beast in my eyes, attacked me viciously, taking a piece of my skinny butt along with him. Thankfully, I did not fall on the ground. I went back home running in severe pain, crying and bleeding. There was pandemonium when my second uncle and the rest of the household saw what had happened. An urgent message was sent to a local dubtara, a priest who also dabbled in folk medicine. There was concern that the dog might be rabid. One way to find out, folk wisdom says, was to get a piece of meat covered with blood from the bite wound and offer it to the dogs in the pack. The bait would attract the dog that bit me. An elderly gentleman who was the security guard and house gatekeeper, Abba Adam, was sent to do that. I'm not sure if eating it would prove the dog to be rabid or the opposite. Um, and I'm just gonna end on that, that cliffhanger. Obviously we kind of know how it ends because my dad is alive and well, but there were, there were a lot of twists and turns <laughs> along the way that are um, described in vivid detail in that chapter. And, um, and I guess just to, to offer, you know, a, a, a little more about why I, you know, wanted to pick that particular excerpt or that chapter is, um, like I said, it's just a story, one, one of the few stories from my dad's very early childhood that, that I just, um, you know, remember really hearing about as a kid, and it definitely left his mark on him. As he notes in the book, he, you know, it, it led to a lifetime uh, fear of dogs, which is uh, no easy thing to deal with when you live in Park Slope, Brooklyn. And, um, and I think it just resonated with me too, because as, you know, second generation kids who, you know, led pretty privileged um, lives, you know, growing up in New York, um, you know, I think just the, everything that sort of unfolds in that chapter really drives home, you know, really just kind of how far removed our childhood experiences um, were from, from our fathers. And, you know, really just the kind of precarious nature of life growing up in a small um, town in Ethiopia. So I thought it was interesting. I'll turn it over to Safi. Hi, uh, so I'm just going to use my father's event to talk a little bit about myself for 
couple of paragraphs, uh, well, with a couple of paragraphs from the book. Um, so uh, in the section he calls With My Son in Shiva Land. Uh, so Safi loved Adwa. My sisters lived in the Indasalasi neighborhood, named after the grand church that sits atop a nearby hill. Safi got to know his cousins. They and some neighborhood kids showed him around, walking uphill in the direction of the Selassie church and other neighborhoods. Some of the houses he saw had thick, ancient looking stone fences, which were objects of fascination. Uh, no one knows how old those stone fences are, but they certainly look centuries old, judging by their similarities to the walls of the Fasilidis castle. We also visited the Masjid Jami, a mosque I had known as a child. I've come to know recently that it was 350, some say 500 years old, and is now in a state of disrepair and at risk of collapsing. Uh, the other objects of fascination were the beautiful scenic mountains of different sizes and shapes that surrounded Adwa. As a student of geography, he was fascinated in the volcanic formation of some of these mountains, some examples of which we were able to see up close as we traveled from Adwa to Adigrat on our way to Mekele. Just about five miles south of Adwa on the way to Adigrat is Yeha, where one finds remnants of the Temple of the Moon built in the 7th to 8th century BC during the Sabian era. Archaeological digs around the temple have uncovered ruins of a city that have been buried. Uh, so you can imagine all of the stories that we grew up hearing, because now you've heard them. Uh, and I was so excited to finally make it to Adwa with my father and to meet family to see the beautiful and unique hillsides and architecture. Uh, I think what struck me was that all of this, the, the landmarks, the famous battle, the famous Hambasha, was happening here in a town that we walked through in just a few minutes, uh, avoiding the dogs. Uh, it spoke to how vivid and larger than life all of these stories and personalities were and how important it was to capture them and share them with future generations of our family, with friends, uh, with his fans, and uh, with the wider world. So uh, really yeah, enjoying seeing this all on paper and gathering everyone here to talk about it. Uh, thank you, um, Safi and Siham. And um, I want to just move things along since I know this is running long. So, um, and like I said, it is my great honor and privilege to introduce my father, Mohammed Nur Hussein, to read from his book, a few excerpts. Um, you've already heard a couple of excerpts from us. Um, so you know um, how uh, not only moving, but just beautifully written the book is. I mean, that was one of the kind of surprises for me because I didn't, you know, I hadn't really read any of my father's writing um, beyond maybe some, you know, official <laughs> letters and things like that. Um, and I was shocked to see how beautifully he writes um, and how well he expresses these um, uh, dramatic and, and sometimes quiet moments from his life. Um, so I, and I think without further ado, I just wanna turn things over to him so we can hear even more from the book. Dad. Thank you, Nadia, Siam, Safi. Uh, and that's just wonderful to hear you um, talk about your uh, favorite paragraphs. And I, I really appreciate that. I love you madly. Um, and I think what I would do in the interest of time, because just looking at the hour here, uh, I didn't realize we've come this far, you know. But there should be some room for the discussion later on. Uh, I'll just pick one um, um, paragraph here. Uh, this is the time when um, many people think the revolution 1974 was the first time that Emperor Haile Selassie was ever uh, challenged. I think uh, prior to that in 1960 there was a coup attempt by his own bodyguard uh, unit and uh, I have titled this The Ill-Conceived and Poorly Executed Coup. I was in the academy at the time, military academy. It was December 13, 1960. 
I was in my second year at the military academy. And I quote here, years of oppression are over. The Ethiopian radio station beamed the baritone voice of the radio journalist, Alan Mazgabe. And the feudal system in, is finished and smashed to smithereens. End of quote. The emperor then on an official visit to Brazil was to be replaced by the crown prince as Fawasan in the interim. The emperor's cousins, cousin and confidant, Ras Emuru, who had enjoyed some popularity in the country, had been named prime minister by the coup leaders. The popular former commander of the imperial bodyguard, General Mulugeta Buli, was called from retirement and was appointed chief of staff of the armed forces. There was something surreal about the radio broadcast and it would have been dismissed as fake news nowadays, since it was inconceivable that this was happening in Ethiopia. If there was one constant in our lives, it was the omnipresence and the omnipotence of the emperor. We went to Haile Selassie first elementary and Haile Selassie first secondary schools, and we graduated to Haile Selassie University or Haile Selassie Military Academy. We walked or drove on Haile Selassie Road in Addis Ababa and other major cities across the country and enjoyed concerts and theatrical performances at the then modern Haile Selassie Theater. Haile Selassie First Hospital in Addis Ababa and other major cities provided care for the sick. His power was absolute and unquestioned. The Ethiopian radio broadcast introduced by an odd and startling strain of martial music announced that the emperor had been removed from the throne. The broadcast ended with the crown prince's address to the nation, enumerating a litany of ills under his father's rule, declaring that he had accepted his limited role as constitutional monarch in the new York. Um, I, gu I guess this was 1960. That, as I mentioned here, I mean, I, I, there was no way that Haile Selassie could be, you know, at all. We, we don't know of any other order or any other, you know, um, ruler except Haile Selassie. So that's why I mentioned that, you know, and then I go on to describe the, how the coup unfolded and eventually uh, fell apart. But um, that gives you the flavor of the times, you know, because this is the time, this now, the history of Ethiopia now uh, is practically, even as recent as during Haile Selassie's time, is, is unknown to the younger generation. I think the revolution has uh, taken care of that by kind of making it more or less, um, you know, I wouldn't say relevant, but, but it's uh, from the public view kind of thing. It's important to know the history I think we have come a long way uh, in that regard. It's not that I am nostalgic for that period, absolutely not. But, but, but uh, um, within my lifetime, Ethiopia has really undergone so many transformations. It's, it's uh, uh, inconceivable for the younger generation uh, to, to think that there, was, there used to be such an Ethiopia <laughs> and how we tolerated that to happen. <laughs> so, uh, that's that's one part. I think I would uh, with the uh, uh, I would I would turn this to Gordon because uh, time is running out, uh, so it gives us a little more time to the discussion part. Uh, maybe some of that will come out later on uh, as we as we go into the uh, discussion with my my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Siham. Thank you, Safi. It was a very interesting segment. Um, good to see the, the doting dad with his beautiful kids sharing these moments, reminiscing. Thank you so much. Um, now we're going to move to another segment. And then this time we will have a panel of Dr. Judy Koryansky. She is a professor of psychology at Teachers College, Columbia University. She's a trustee of the United African Congress. We have Mr. Milton Alimadi, he's a published professor of African studies, John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and publisher of Black Star News. 
We have Mama Dunian, CEO of Next Media, and Miss Jessica Bisher, actress, film director, producer, and cinematographer. And they will be on with um, uh, Dr. Nurasain. They will be talking about the book. They will be asking him questions um, about all different aspects. And um, that should begin now. But actually, before that, Dr. Nurasain mentioned something very interesting to me um, yesterday or the day before, when he was in Yugoslavia. And something I did not know. He mentioned that um, Louis, Louis Armstrong performed at the concert and he went to this concert and that the, the Yugoslavian people were so overwhelmed with his virtuosity that they got on the stage and they even kissed his shoes. They worshiped him. And I found that to be very interesting. I hope somebody asking him about um, what Western music and what jazz and actually what people of color meant at that time. Take it away, Judy. Wow, well, we are learning so much about our dear friend and colleague, Dr. Mohammed Nur Hussein, A as the middle initial. No one has mentioned that yet. It is important. <laughs> Does anyone know what the A stands for? I'm sure the children do. Anyone else? Nope. <laughs> no takers. Okay, Alamin, which is the name that you were known as when you were growing up. We all knew you as Mohammed, but you were Alamin, meaning trustworthy. All right, that's very important. Second really interesting game show point about our dear Dr. Nur Hussein, and that is what game show was he almost this close to being a contest on? Anyone know? Read carefully in the book, word <laughs> by word. This close he came to being on Jeopardy. That's how smart he is. How amazing that point is. And in fact, I've got four hats that I really need to, in getting to my question about you really be dealing with, I could even put them on. You know, first as a journalist, uh, that I've read so many books, speed reading in my career uh, uh, as a talk show host uh, on TV and, and, and radio, but I couldn't read your book, speed reading. I had to read every word. It was so compelling and interesting. The dog story that, <laughs> that one of your daughters talked about, your military training, your learning medicine and in Latin and Slovakian, amazing. And how you were, how you, I'm not gonna put my next hat on as a military brat because of your military training, okay? You did not want to go to military training. You hated going into that. You thought you were a loser being, being chosen to do that. And yet, look what it led to. You're meeting Haile Selassie. You're being picked out of everybody to be put on such a pedestal. This is an astounding part of your career. Another hat, your historian, we all know like how you have managed to squash into this book everything about history. Your jazz knowledge of Duke Ellington, your movie knowledge of John Wayne, your sports knowledge of the Mets' Daryl Strawberry, your music knowledge of, my goodness, Freddie Mercury from Queen, where is all this stored in your head that you have brought out in the story of your life? It's just absolutely brilliant. And last but not least, as a psychologist, this gets to my question, me being a psychologist and reading your touching story about your wife and your mother and your children, of course, with one boy, but how much you loved your family and adored your wife and adored that your mother adored you, that you describe that you were a scrawny, skinny, lagged, large-handed, sickly child, but your mother adored you. 
through all your illnesses and helped you. And that when, after you went to Zagreb and you came back, that in fact, your biggest joy was going back to Ethiopia and seeing your mother and how her face, being that her name means illuminate, um, lit up. And so what I want to ask you, my dear friend, Dr. Mohammed Alamin <laughs> Nur Hussein, what do you think your mother would say now if she were able to be on the Zoom with us? Oh, thank you, my dear friend, Judy. Thank you for putting out the middle initial because that was the name that I was known by until, well, throughout my uh, elementary school days. Uh, everybody calls me Alamin and, and also family members know me as Alamin even now. So that's very important. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I do mention my mother. Uh, I, you know, her capacity for love and nurturing is, is just uh, immense. I mean, I was a nagging, nagging, sickly, annoying child but uh, never really saw her annoyed by that, you know, uh, other than to show me the love and the attention that I needed. So um, I think I'd just, I think she would have been, uh, she would have felt uh, fulfilled to see me in this position, you know, for taking care of me during all these years and, and uh, you know, and, and to see me now, uh, it would have been, uh, uh, probably the, the, the happiest of her, uh, you know, her life uh, that she would feel. I, uh, it was not meant to be. Well, she has seen me achieve all those. Uh, she, she saw me become a doctor. Uh, I went back to see her, and uh, and she was happy that I really uh, got to where I am, and insisted that I go back and. Uh, and do my work and, and uh, to my family and so on, despite the fact she was on her uh, deathbed, essentially. She insisted that I go back to the US. So um, you're right, that I should have been happy. So. Blessings. Okay, all right. Let's Very sweet. Question. Shall we move on to Milton? Yes, uh, greetings. I want to thank everybody participating on this uh, book signing. I want to say congratulations to my good comrade and friend, Dr. Nursein Mohammed. I'm glad that I'm meeting the family electronically. Uh, Siham, Safi, Nadia. I'm glad I got to meet the children of this great individual. And you see where his compassion comes from and his sense of justice and always fighting for the underdog. It comes from his own painful experience as a person living in a marginalized segment of this great country in Ethiopia. And that sense of justice has driven him. It's been a lifelong drive. And you see that in all the events that he participates in, whether it's a large event or whether the way he deals with individuals. Uh, this is the book this is how books should be written. It's lively, I agree with Dr. Judy. It's a page turner. Uh, and that's how history should be written and memoirs should be written. In terms of the book's more foundational importance, I wanna read something which was written by Mohammed Babu. And Dr. Nurusain knows who Mohammed Babu was, the minister in Tanzania in the 1960s and 70s. This is what he wrote in the postscript to Walter Rodney's book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Quote, to know the present, we must look into the past. And to know the future, we must look into the past and the present. I think that description really lends itself to this book perfectly. And not only for Ethiopia, but for Africans. And I agree with the previous speakers who said, this is beyond made in Ethiopia. So I apologize, my good friend. This is actually made in Africa and then made in Ethiopia. I, I love your sense of Pan-Africanism as well. And we see where it came from. And I like how you reveal in the book that in fact, a teacher was instrumental in imbuing that to you. 
So that goes back to showing the importance of teachers and how individuals can change and impact our lives. So I would like to read very quickly and it will take only about a minute. This is from page 57. <clears throat> Quote, one of my favorite leaders, teachers in the ninth grade was an Indian history teacher, Mr. Tangabello from the Southern Indian state of Kerala. He stood up from the rest because he made learning history relevant and fun. He taught a class called Current Events where he spoke with passion of the drive for liberation in Africa and Asia, of the Egyptian revolution of 1952, and of the Iranian prime minister, Mohammed Mossadegh, who nationalized the Anglo-Iranian oil company in 1951. He spoke admiringly of leaders like Nehru, Surkano, Tito, Nkrumah, and NASA as champions of the anti-colonial and anti-imperialist bloc that led to the emergence of the Not-Aligned Movement following the Bandung Conference in 1955. He also spoke of the early civil rights movement in the United States. Our history teacher had inspired me to read more and more, and he played a significant role in my early understanding of the Cold War, the various African liberation movements, colonialism, imperialism, and communism. I'd like to end there. But this is my question to my good friend, Dr. Noor Singh. That really captures a very transitional and interesting moment in Africa's history, in world history, in fact. And there's a sense of what phenomenal opportunities existed at that moment in time. Can you imagine if some of those issues that your, your teacher was teaching you and that you thought about had been captured where Africa would be today? The lost opportunity for pan-African evolution and African unity. So I would like you, as you look back now from this vantage point at that moment in history, in a quick, short, perhaps response, can you tell us how you feel about the lost hopes and opportunities, and what lessons can we gain going forward from that moment in history? Thank you. Thank you, my friend, Conrad, uh, Milton. I think the, the, uh, the lost opportunity that you talk about indeed was a lost opportunity immediately uh, post-colonial Africa. I think uh, the first and foremost emphasis should have been uh, uh, made on on uh, exploring African history to start with. I think we still remained uh, under the influence of colonial educational systems that continue to marginalize the contributions of Africans in that area. Uh, I think it's only later on, you know, uh, uh, decades later that we are we have come to know about um, African history, Africana departments, and so on that are exploring this area. Otherwise, um, even growing up in Ethiopia, an independent country, uh, uh, there was very little we knew other than the chronicle of the emperors uh, of Ethiopia. Um, uh, nothing much about people's history there. And certainly nothing about the rest of Africa. Uh, but we did uh, learn about the glory of the British Empire, <laughs> the greatness of the American, um, you know, uh, a capitalist system and so on. So, uh, you know, I think that opportunity was really at the founding, uh, you know, moment of African countries uh, to emphasize history at that period. This one person, Indian teacher, who just touched on this, this is outside the curriculum, by the way, he doesn't, you know, and it was considered kind of uh, nothing short of revolutionary for anybody to speak of those things in those days. So uh, I bet that it did leave uh, an uh, impact on me and, and several of my, uh, uh, you know, uh, so, um, you know uh, at the time, uh, schoolmates. So uh, emphasis on history and exploring history is important. I think history is important. Uh, First of all, that's what I need to say. Uh, you know, uh, if you don't know where you came from, you know, uh, you don't know where you're going, that kind of uh, famous African saying uh, is true. I mean, you, you just can't go if you don't know where you came from. Uh, you can go further. So um, I, I think I would answer it that way. Thank you. And I just wanted to note that, that teacher got kicked out of the country for that kind of teaching. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, he was kicked out. He didn't Thank last. you. Thank you, mate, yeah. John, for the question. Um, I see Mamadou popped up a while ago. No, I'm here. There he is. <laughs> okay, Mamadou, your turn. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, well, greetings to all, all of my friends. So, you know, this is for me, this is one moment where I lament about the, the double-edged sword of this magnificent technology of Zoom. Uh, you know, we, we could not have dreamt of being able to connect uh, more than 70 people, certainly from different continents in one platform for this unbelievable conversation. But at the same time, believe me, I truly miss the physical proximity. I miss the one-on-one -on -one exchanges. I miss the person-to-person -person talk. I miss sitting my friends on a pedestal and having Dr. Kurinsky of Milt or Milton uh, speaking with him, engaging him in front of a magnificent crowd. But uh, things being what they are, we have to be happy with this. And we hope that, uh, that uh, this is just a book lounge. When I have a conversation with, uh, with Gordon, I say, well, we need a book party. And, uh, and, and life made it that these past two months have been incapacitated personally, professionally, and medically. That's why I have not been able to participate more vehemently in the preparation of this event. But Mohammed knows that the book party is on my calendar. <laughs> and the book party is going to be a physical event whenever this pandemic recedes, or maybe even before that. Because, uh, you know, there is a magic of media campaign that we need to do for this book. We have to massively broadcast this book around all the corners of the world. But beginning here in New York City, there is a swath, there is a number of African academics whom we know who legitimately should be in this conversation. So we're gonna find a way to bring them all together, all right, when we can do that. But, uh, but for my friend and my, I call him my big brother, <laughs> uh, kudos for this fascinating book, Mohammed. Uh, you're telling a big story uh, using, you know, an archive of narrative tools where you are the protagonist, but actually everyone in every corner of Ethiopia that you've touched is given enough space in this book. Uh, it seems like uh, not one page of your life is left unturned. <laughs> and... Uh, and one feels that uh, uh, you started actually taking notes at age three uh, <laughs> for, for this gripping personal, <laughs> it's unbelievable. At age three, you've been looking, you've been gauging, you've been scrutinizing. Uh, you know, for me, uh, not only, believe me, the reportorial style, you know, we know it is generic to the Richard Kapuscinski, you know, and the Toro and all of those. Uh, but you clearly not only have the stories to tell, but you have, you have garnered the arsenal of tools to tell it. Uh, but also, uh, you know, the sidekick like your love affair with Injera, uh, your moving connection with your mother, Everything in this book, of course, and the delightful union that unfortunately tragically ended uh, with the loss, the loss of your beloved and the mother of your magnificent children. So I thought, you know, Mohammed, I thought I knew you, but after I read this book, uh, I realized that I didn't know you. Now I know you after I read Made in Ethiopia. Uh, you know, I, I was aware uh, I was aware of the historical ethnic tensions in Ethiopia, but not so much about the religious bigotry, which you paint with such a depth and damning tale. And I want to get back to you later though, but I felt I have to say this because 
it looks, looks to me like I have read some chapter of this book even before this one. I, I, I felt inevitable for me reading Made in Ethiopia to also think about another book, Wounded Nation, which is another personal journal, a book that looked critically about the political history of Eritrea. It is Dr. Bereket Selassie's 2011 book where he writes this, to answer today's question, we need to look into the past. Now, you know, uh, uh, Ron Daniels said it earlier, we cannot go to the future until we look back. So the professor, Bereket, I know Mohammed, he's your alter ego, he's your brother. <laughs> You've done so many different things and you talk endlessly. And Dr. Bereket is as much an Ethiopian as he is an Eritrean. So even though Wounded Nation is a political essay mourning the fate of Eritrea, lamenting the unfinished business of the Republic, I see the resonance with your book and in the past of Ethiopia with a heavy dose of melancholy that you set so much light to make us understand today. So I just wanted to make a note of that. But uh, the brilliant and exceptional student who thrives in front of adversity and loneliness that you were, who is denied the prize he won because he's a young Muslim, who wants to go to study abroad but has been refused that opportunity because of a Muslim, whose second grade teacher refuses to say his name right. So you know, as a West African, I have much to learn from Ethiopia from your own experience. The class of religious identities in Ethiopia makes me think about the two realities of our shared experience the intractable tension conflict between religion and ethnicity, you know, like two or three decades ago, it was actually from West to East Africa, it was the tension between tradition and modernity. But religious fanaticism is consuming West Africa today. The visceral religious wars in Mali, Nigeria, Cameroon, Chad, those are perpetrated by thugs against everyone else on the name of Allah. That's Islamic terror. So we will yeah. talk about that. Also, you were born Muhammad at the place that struck a blow for freedom for, from colonialism, Adwa. Adwa is the epicenter of African liberation on the continent. Ethiopia, your country was not a colony. Mine was. You're, I'm, you're I'm, Mamadou? I'm, I'm finished. I'm going to conclude this. Okay. I'm just going to finish this. Never was Ethiopia a colony. So what you call the symbol of your oppression is uh, 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 Christianity. For me, in Senegal, it was French colonialism. So this is where we learn from each other about our shared political history. So I just wanted to say that if you want to pick up on the conflict between the religious entities, you and I had a conversation about this before, but I wanted to remind everybody that that will be a book party that will be, uh, that will be announced at one point when Gordon can, 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 can put this one together again. Thank you. Thank you, Mamadou. When the time comes, we will announce it. We'll publicize it and we'll be happy to support it. No question about that. And um, I want to remind everyone who is on that you may order the book at www.africaworldpressbooks.com. The, 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 the website the address is in the chat box, so you can take a look at it. And in any event, we will be emailing that out to everyone
who has registered and we have their email address. So please be sure to purchase this. Um, oh, great. All right, you can put it up again. Now we have another panelist, um, a very special panelist who will be um, posing the next question to Dr. Mohammed, or, or as Mamadou did, um, made a commentary, um, which was really very interesting and very relevant and contained questions that Africa and the colonial powers really need to respond to. Anyway, uh, Miss Jessica Bashir, can you pull her up, please? Am I on? Here you go. Oh. Okay, first of all, I want to say thank you so, 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 so much for um, having me in this panel today. It is such an honor for me to be here celebrating uh, Dr. Mohammed's uh, book launch. And, but most importantly, this feels like a, a family get together. It is uh, really my honor, my honor to be here. I want to echo a little bit, you know, the sentiment that most friends and family have uh, said uh, about uh, Dr. Muhammad. Um, I met him because my father and Dr. Muhammad went to the military academy that Haile Selassie's military academy and that uh, Dr. Muhammad speaks about. So they went, they were together in that place. So one day my father and mother came to visit, they don't, they live in Mexico. They came to visit here and they said, oh, you know, my friend, he lives in Park Slope. I, I think we need to get to see him. And it was Dr. Muhammad. And that's how I, was, I got introduced to, um, to him. And, uh, and ever since I have to say, you know, um, he has been, and a mentor, he has been a friend, he has been a father, he has been a champion um, uh, of my artistic practice. Um, he, because he literally very much encouraged me so, uh, some of my films were able to go to Sundance because he was always saying, yes, you can do it. And I will never forget that. So I just wanted to say that you know, first and foremost. But um, regarding the book, I want to say that um, we've heard before about the dangers of, uh, of a single narrative or of a single story. And what Dr. Muhammad uh, does here in this book, it is so, 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 so um, needed at this specific moment, especially in, in Ethiopian history and what is going on today because um, this is such uh, an unapologetically personal uh, story that uh, of course in the personal is the, po is the political. And here you see uh, how much the, the fabric of the Ethiopian um, nations and peoples were completely trampled upon by one single story. And so it is such a, it is so refreshing to hear this, uh, this other narrative completely. Um, I feel also my father is a Muslim and um, you know, growing up in Ethiopia, it was something that I, I didn't necessarily know how to articulate, you know, but, but reading obviously um, Dr. Muhammad's book I really feel seen. I really feel like um, I am reading a lot of my own experiences growing up. Uh, I feel like, uh, yes, seen, you know, by, by that. But most importantly, I feel like uh, the, the, the fact that he went head on to tackle that elephant in the room which is that uh, same uh, religious bigotry that uh, Mamadou was speaking of, I think it's very courageous. I think it's very courageous and I think it's very generous you know, of you to do so because um, by doing that, you are um, 
giving the permission for others to do so as well. And this is the multiplicity of stories is what we need right now. Now, um, one of uh, the scenes that um, I was very struck by, especially you know, uh, from, uh, from the hotter uh, uh, section, was the one in which you were uh, doing an exercise you know, with a compass and uh, you would be left in the middle of nowhere to find your way back home. And I mean, back to the military academy. And then when you ask someone um, uh, if there were any people around, uh, the, the person that you asked was, was not considering the Oromo people as people. And that was just so uh, poignant. And it's just so like really, really, really touching on that wound that today is um, almost, we're almost on a, on a, at the brink of a civil war because of this. And, you know, you touch that so um, cinematically, you know? And that was just to me so amazing. So I would love to 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 hear more about it. I would love to hear, you know, what really compelled you to 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 again to speak about this this um, unbelonging. I mean, I know what com might have compelled you, but but where did you get? How did you get the courage to do? Especially. Um, you know, writing about Ethiopia, where that one single narrative has been so prevalent. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Jessica. Uh, I, I'm glad you mentioned uh, that uh, your dad and I were together at the military academy, and we're still uh, very close friends, you know, <laughs> communicate every uh, frequently. Um, the the uh, I, I needed to write all these things because I think I think in order to find solutions we need to know ourselves, we need to know uh, our you know uh, biases, our um, weaknesses. I mean, uh, no matter which side it came from. I mean, first of all, I'm talking about a country that's extremely inscrutable. The people are very complex. And uh, by that I mean in a very complementary way. It's a complex uh, uh, country. Uh, very um, well. First of all, there are eighty languages in the country, and nationalities. Uh, so what you are seeing now is really the the, the uh, coming to awareness of many of these various marginalized communities to be counted in one way or the other. You know. Um, but Ethiopia, like I said, is, is, is an ancient country also that has a, a lot going for it. First of all, it is a, a country that had significant uh, Jewish presence before Christianity. Mm -hmm. so, uh, partly it was Jewish uh, in addition to the indigenous uh, religions. Uh, and it was the, you know, the first Christian state, uh, self-proclaimed Christian state. Um, and it was also, uh, you can say, the first Muslim uh, country in a way because Islam was worshipped freely two years before the um, pilgrimage, before the uh, Hijra, the, the, the uh, flight to, to Medina, which considered the, fir the beginning of Islam. So it's, a, it's a really the home of the Abrahamic religions, uh, the three Abrahamic religions. Um, and, and they have been um, coexisting with tensions now and then and so on, but eventually what described the country was the culture and the history was the, uh, the, 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 the crown and the identity of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Um, and that has been the pattern over the past, you know, a millennia and a half. So that's, that's what I, you know, you have to see it in that context. And, uh, um, on individual level, personal level, we can have really very, very nice, cordial, honest friendship uh, or communities. But, but the, the whole idea of, of marginalization of people because of religion or ethnicity is not of the land, too. And that has to get known. You don't really begin to find solutions for that. So that's, that's my reason for, for bearing my soul in this, uh, honestly, as honestly as I can get. You know, I mean, 
um, that the chips fall where they may, but, but that's really uh, with the, with the uh, intention, with the good intention of letting uh, my uh, fellow Ethiopians know, you know, what we are about, at least uh, that we are not uh, a homogeneous, uh, one narrative kind of people. We are multicultural. And, uh, and that's really the message I want to send. Um, uh, so yes, uh, I do describe incidents like that to highlight where, uh, you know, some of the unpleasantness that may exist uh, in from what I encounter. So thank you for the question. No, I, feel, I felt, you know, that was just so, um, that was so, uh, you know, as I was reading your book, literally, I was just, I was feeling like I was reading almost the genesis of all the, the of what is going on in Ethiopia today, you know, uh, the, the genesis of the, the discontent, you know, um, but uh, yeah, but I just wanted to say thank you so much and congratulations for this just beautiful, amazing book and that all of the friends and the families here to celebrate you. I really am so honored. I am so honored to, to, to be part of this. And I want to thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jessica. At this point, um, Dr. Neu we, 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 Dr. Neurosen's book, is about his life growing up from a little kid, as he says, from a, a barefoot boy and up to his retirement as a, a doctor. And, um, and now I have someone who's going to pick up from his retirement up to this point, and which is a preview to his next book. Dr. Judy, um, could we have the, the video um, put up tomorrow? Now, there are 20 seconds. Each, each slide will be up for 20 seconds. So you do have enough time to talk about it and keep going through. So in fact, as we look at these new photos, this is the next installment. We've been left at a cliffhanger at the point of Dr. New Hussein's entrance. And here we see how much he is doing at the world stage again with regard to the United Nations and human rights. And actually there are three persons there you will very much recognize, Ambassador Y and um, Gordon Tapper uh, from the United African Congress, which is so much a part of his life now these are indeed friends, again, from the United African Congress. Mohammed reaching out his hand there and being with Dr. Burke, who is in fact the father of our former ambassador to the United Nations and Gary from our UHC, and that is a member of the um, UNICEF. And here, the United African Congress, you can see our chairman there, Mohammed, with Gordon Tapper, and with um, Ambassador Y and with dignitaries from the United Nations when we gave three ambassadors the Bridges Across Borders Award at a gala at the Friars Club. And that includes some very important um, ambassadors at the UN, the ambassador of Equatorial Guinea and of, of Benin and of the African Union. And here you see, in fact, the musketeers at the United Nations, Gordon Tapper and Sadiq Wai and Mohammed, uh, all together in many events that we have done for the World Interfaith Harmony Week. This is Mohammed speaking on behalf of the United African Congress at a major event at the United Nations, sitting next to the representative from WHO about uh, the Ebola epidemic and what we have been doing at the United Nations with regard to that, speaking to many, many countries and member states. Here you see Mohammed at another conference at the United Nations next to Ambassador Y, then the president of the UAC, 
um, the United African Congress, speaking out about the importance of interfaith harmony and the importance of peace. And this is a very important recent event of World Interfaith Harmony Week at the United Nations when, um, when Mohammed spoke, as well as myself and one of my Chinese students, Jai Wen Long, about the importance of paying attention to the threat of COVID-19 in Africa on February 4th, way before there was one case in Africa. I wrote about that for Black Star News, which is of course published by our good friend Moha the Milton Alamadi here, and wrote about the important statements that our dear Dr. Nur Hussein made with regard to the alert that we needed to be on guard for. So many things will come up in the next installment. And Mohammed, we look forward to that because you have had just as illustrious a career after that so-called retirement as you, we have been treated to now with many things that you have done on the global stage to help our world and to help the continent. Thank you, Judy. That's fantastic. I don't know if Dr. Nurishain wants to make some response, some comment on that, on, his, on, on the preview of his new book, which he hasn't started to write yet. But, you know, Dr. Judy is going to make sure that he gets started before long. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, my dear, dear, dear friend, uh, Dr. Judy. I think, I think uh, now the onus is on me to come up with, with the next book. I <laughs> Even if I hadn't thought about it, but now I have to start thinking seriously about following up uh, on this one. Um, I, I, I think uh, I, I, this is a, perhaps a good opportunity to really uh, thank, um, uh, first of all, of course, uh, uh, Judy, uh, who has been always very, very encouraging, even as I was writing this book, um, uh, her, her kind words and encouragement have been really the, the, the uh, things that uh, kept me going. And, and uh, I, I do appreciate uh, really, um, uh, and thank you, honestly. Um, uh, Gordon, uh, Gordon you, you, you've been um, uh, through thick and thin with us with through the United African Congress and your own organization, Give Them a Hand Foundation, um, um, working together over the past 10 years and uh, uh, you know, uh, after your retirement from the United Nations, I think it's uh, needless to say it's one of the um, highlights of my career to have uh, had the opportunity to work with you and, and to get to know you as a friend. And, um, uh, you know, uh, Jessica, of course, I came to know um, yeah, when uh, um, her father. Uh, mentioned that she was uh, here in Brooklyn and I should reach out to her. <laughs> so, and um, I mean, she is an extremely talented young lady. Uh, she has some remarkable uh, films uh, which uh, really need to uh, be uh, seen by the rest of the world uh, once they are properly um, um, edited and finished, which she is in the process of doing. Uh, she has already won, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, multiple honors at the Sundance and several other film festivals for short uh, stories. But this one, now she's working on uh, full feature films. So it's been a pleasure and an honor to get to know you, uh, Jessica, really. I mean, so, I mean, I, I, Mamadou, Mamadou actually, uh, I don't know, I know him for not so many years and I have always been uh, amazed uh, at uh, uh, his, uh, his ability to uh, uh, weave uh, things together in any gathering uh, with a good uh, understanding of the history and letting people know how to connect the dots, you know, of every issue and so on. And um, of course, I have been the beneficiary of his friendship and. Uh, whom I consider really a dear brother. Um, and uh, I, uh, you know, I really appreciate uh, your kind words. Uh, 
Milton, Milton, the publisher of Black Star News. Um, I must confess here, and uh, I don't think he would uh, accuse me later on since I have publicly confessed it. I have taken almost a page out of his book uh, on the Battle of Adwa, which has so beautifully written how the venerable New York Times covered the Battle of Adwa, uh, showing uh, Italy winning and, and how uh, these savages would be taught and so on and stuff, you know. And uh, I mean, I, language that, that uh, to today's ears is almost, uh, for a newspaper of that stature, in incredible, impossible to uh, Thank you. Thank take, you. But, but that's uh, how they portray it. And uh, I just had to uh, quote him uh, there when I was discussing about Lok Adwa. Uh, he's been a dear friend. And of course, uh, I have been the beneficiary of a column of his uh, wonderful digital paper. So, uh, I mean, a uh, newspaper, uh, and he's a, a, you know, a fighter for, for uh, human rights and African rights, definitely. Uh, the, uh, my uh, friend, a longtime friend and um, a partner in crime, um, you know, uh, well, the longest actually goes to, uh, you know, in many ways, uh, His Excellency, um, uh, Sutai Zarihun, who at the, day, at the risk of uh, dating him, I think goes back 50 years more uh, since the military academy days. And we had a wonderful time together uh, back then and back here in New York, uh, where we um, uh, shared the same interests. Uh, uh, some of the things that I mentioned in the book are actually with him and my friend Wodajo. Uh, and we have kept that, that bond ever since. And thank you for, for really coming and being able to say um, a few words on that, uh, on, our, on our friendship. Um, uh, my my uh, colleague and friend and, and, and um, partner in the United African Congress, the former president of the United African Congress, uh, actually a founder, uh, who has cheered the organization so magnificently over the years to the prominence that it is in now and uh, has become the, the go-to uh, Pan-African organization in the United States, uh, highly regarded by diplomats uh, um, from the African Union and uh, other, other diplomats. So we have been engaged in so many things together I don't want to repeat, you know, uh, what has been said already, and uh, I think that will be the topic of my uh, next book. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, now, I don't uh, uh, last, uh, certainly not the uh, list, but uh, uh, is my my mentor, my big brother, my friend, uh, Professor Bereket Hector Selassie. Uh, whose uh, friendship goes back to the uh, harder days when he was a mayor and I was just a young uh, military doctor assigned to the third division hospital in Harar. Um, we practically met every day. This was at the time of political ferment in Ethiopia. The students, uh, um, you know, there was unrest all over high schools and colleges and uh, we always kind of got together with another friend of ours who was uh, a teacher at the uh, Alamaya College, a very, very militant Marxist uh, professor of linguistics. So the, the three of us practically met every day and, and uh, appraised each other of what's going on and uh, both in the government, in uh, schools and the military and so on, um, at, at the Ras Hotel, which I described as the Den of Spies, mm -hmm. was the meeting place of all the all kinds of uh, really people who have been around that cafe. Uh, God knows what they were doing. Uh, uh, so it, it, that's the meeting place. And uh, we have maintained the friendship. We have uh, kept the, uh, you know, uh, our families. In fact, my kids call him Uncle Baraker because uh, that's how they know him, you know, <laughs> uh, when he, you know, used to spend a lot of time with us uh, when uh, my late wife Zara was uh, alive and when the kids were growing. So uh, this, is, uh, this is really an incredible uh, experience for me to witness 
so many friends uh, that that care for me and and and, uh, and have uh, helped uh, make me the person that I am since coming to these United States and some of them back in Ethiopia. So uh, I can only say, and oh my gosh, how could I? Pray? You asked Professor Shimelis, how did we meet here? I, I, he did not respond, did he? No. <laughs> Well, actually, no. Uh, no we met here. He's a highly regarded historian among the Ethiopian scholars right now coming out of Ethiopia who really are studying the history of Ethiopia uh, in a very, uh, doing quite a, a lot of research and trying to give uh, an objective history of Ethiopia, not the history chronicle of emperors and churches and so on, but, but you know, people of history. And, and he's one of those, uh, very, very highly regarded. Uh, both at home and here. And uh, my cousin Elias was the one who mentioned him to me first time and uh, we got to meet together. And since then we've been really quite, quite close. And uh, um, he was one of those that I uh, approached to write a blurb on the book, which has kindly done so. And as did uh, Dr. Judy Sherry Wills and Ambassador Y. Uh, I think their blurbs are all, you know, masterpieces. You should get, <laughs> take a, a chance to read them, you know. So I thank you very much. What can I say? I mean, and thank you to all that tuned in. I know some of my friends have already, through the chat box, I have seen, I have, uh, are uh, listening to this. Uh, perhaps I can get to back to you at some point uh, personally, but I really want to thank you. Thank you all from the um, friends from Ethiopian American Doctors Group. Thank you people from Brooklyn for Peace. And uh, thank you other friends who uh, uh, we have uh, um, met uh, on many occasions here. Um, I, just, I, just, I just feel blessed. And um, last but not least, my, my children. What can I say? I just love you. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful, Dr. Mohammed. That's fantastic. Um, we are at the end of our program. I just want to, ex um, I just, okay. I just want to really express the, my appreciation to everyone who got on this uh, Zoom call and um, to support Dr. Nurusain's book. Um, the speech, the, the, the speakers were wonderful, were engaging, were interesting. We learned a lot about Dr. Nurusain, and um, really, that is, it was a very fantastic experience here. Um, I'm not going to close this until I get Ambassador Y back on the screen, because no one can be as effective as him in a diplomatic way of getting you to purchase the book. <laughs> Ambassador Y, you will have the last word, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. I, um, it, it is also wonderful to see my comrades, Milton, uh, Mamadou, Mamadou has now moved from being a journalist to a philosopher. Really wonderful. It's great to see them all. And Dr. Judy uh, Borden, yourself, really pulling this together and pulling us all together is something that uh, we really have to be uh, thankful to you because scripting this is, is, is not easy. But like Dr. Nurosin always says, once the maestro and Judy are on board, we're going to have a flawless and effective uh, process. <clears throat> the thing that uh, I think if we, if we recall during all of this process, my own thoughts were always saying, we do all of this, uh, we're going to buy the book. Uh, <clears throat> right now, I have received money for 20 books. Uh, people came to visit me here and I said, I'm buying 10 books. 
then my visitor said, I am matching you, Ambassador, with 10 bucks. So <clears throat> this, book, this book is not going to get on the bestseller list if it is not purchased. So I know we have 54 people. We had about, I think Mamadou was the one that said, I think we had almost from the beginning close to about 70 on this call. Yeah, we had 73 at the, 73. At the top. <laughs> yeah, we had 73. So I know quite a lot of these people came because they love and they care about somebody who has loved and cared for not only Ethiopians, but the whole world. And what I would like to suggest, uh, all of my friends and Dr. Nurosin's friends here, I want <clears throat> to have a specific challenge. I'm throwing a specific challenge to them. And maybe even humbly asking them that I have bragged around the world that this is going to be a bestseller. But until we could say to the publisher, we want more books printed. And until we get to when Mamadou is going to have that big party, which will be the party of the century, it is a, more, a very unusual book launching. Uh, we're going to be celebrating the life of uh, an icon. But for today, at least, I want to have uh, how many Mamadou? How many? 70 something? 73 was the highest. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I purchased 10 books. I have another money for purchase for 10. So that's 20 from my side. So I'm asking everyone to do their best. So at least, even if it's two, you don't have to keep it in your library. You could give that as a, a, a holiday gift because this book is compelling. Uh, this book, especially those of us who have, who had to leave our countries to come somewhere. And for him, you know, to face discrimination, I mean, I think that's a nice way of putting it because you're a Muslim, <laughs> you have Eli Selassie, you got all of those people. You could not even practice your religion in a freer way. And to come here, still not leaving his country, but caring about his country, that's the story that each and every one of us who come from somewhere could tell. So this is not, uh, <clears throat> with all due respect, Mr. Chairman, this book is not made, uh, made in Ethiopia. Like Gordon and all the people said, this book is made in the world. <laughs> so, <laughs> because there are pieces in this book that everybody could relate to. And I'm, I'm, I'm also throwing this to uh, Jessica. Well, you have uh, the opportunity for another movie here on the life of uh, a, a, a freedom fighter in Ethiopia. His life alone, it would be better than any big movie screen. And I know you and Mama do have this in common. And guess what? If we have to bring water to make this uh, movie, we will make sure this movie is played everywhere in the world. And to make this, to be this as a living testimony, people could uh, know their history, what happened in the past, and where they are going. So since uh, Gordon threw this to me, uh, I always like to do this when they invite me to go to a big uh, celebrations these days. And I will take out, uh, you know, I said, we're here to raise funds. So I will start. And I'll bring all the leaders. So. I have now 
throwing a challenge here. I have bought 10 books. I have money for another 10 books. I want everybody on this panel to buy, to commit that they are buying, they are purchasing whatever number of those books right here publicly, openly, because the chairman always insists on transparency and accountability. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so very much. And um, we're expecting the support of everyone who is on this Zoom. You will get an email this evening and we will be asking you to make your commitment the email will have the, 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 the website where you can order the book and uh, all the arrangements, what you need to do, what you need to say in the, in, the, in the box to be able to get that discount and to be able to get a signed copy. Now, you're gonna be one of the lucky ones. When this book wins a Pulitzer Prize or some other prize, you will know you have a signed copy from the author. So all, I would like to, to thank you all um, very much. Um, my last comment will be, Dr. Nourisain, United African Congress, Give Them a Hand Foundation, later International Association of Applied Psychology, have been hosting every year since 2012, a World Interfaith Harmony event. I never, I now look at Dr. Nourishain's leadership in this series of events in a somewhat different light. He has not, he has never shown any type of discrimination, any type of leaning. If he is thinking of inviting a Muslim, an Imam to speak, he thinks also of inviting a Christian, a Jewish, and uh, uh, Hindu, I've never seen any, 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 any negative, any discrimination, any fallout from his earlier experience. And I think that tells you the type of person he is. And that's why we love him. And thank you all very much for being here, for participating in this event. I would give my colleagues each a half a minute to say something, but I'm not gonna do it because I know you will each take five minutes, which is not good. Here is Dr. Bedeket. Dr. Bedeket. Dr. Bedeket. Hello, Dr. Bedeket. Yes, Mr. Kaka, how are you doing now? I, I, I'm good, we're still on, we're wrapping up. So maybe you wanna have a final word to Dr. Mohammed. I will, I will, thank you, thank you. I enjoyed uh, the, the whole session. Uh, there wasn't enough time to say so much about him, especially the family. Uh, I would like to say that he has a charming family. I knew the kids, the children when they were kids. Uh, Safi was, I think, one year old when I stayed with them in Staten Island. And I knew them from their childhood. They're a wonderful family, charming. They're like my family. And uh, their mother was like my daughter. Mm. Yes, so we are family and, and I have wonderful memories of that. So reading the book brought back a lot of memories to me. And today the children reading those passages of their father's book that touched my heart. Uh, and so my friend, Mohammed, congratulations. You've done a wonderful job. Uh, and uh, your children are proud of you. We are all proud of you. You should be proud of yourself. That's all I can say. Okay, thank you. Dr. Mohammed, you may say uh, thank you. <laughs> what can I say to uh, my friend Bereket? Um, I, I thank you for those kind words, really. Uh, Bereket, you've been. You've been uh, uh, an inspiring figure um, to many Ethiopians of my generation, particularly to me through our association over the years. 
And, um, and I think uh, it thanks to you and your encouragement that I was able to write this one. Of course, your uh, uh, memoir, The Crown and the Pen, was uh, uh, served as sort of a template for me to mm. uh, follow. And, and um, of course, you, since then, you have been so many wonderful books that I think uh, people on this uh, Zoom session should know about and check him out. Um, it's just not, uh, it's not only as a professor of law and professor of African studies um, that we know him, but he's also a, a novelist and uh, um, uh, a poet and, uh, you know, he's, he's a man of war for all seasons, uh, I, uh, you know, multifaceted uh, kind of uh, writer. So thank you, uh, my friend Barakat. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Judy, you have 20 seconds. <laughs> I think that uh, the fascination of the journey that you have gone through in all cultures, from religion to history to music to boxing, by the way, is quite <laughs> a credit to you. And we all see you not only in a new light, but in a beautiful light. And we cherish you. Wow, beautiful. Jessica? You have 20 seconds. Jessica? That's not fair. That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> well, just really quickly, I just want to say, Dr. Muhammad, everyone, thank you for being here. But Dr. Muhammad, thank you so, 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 so much for being such an inspiring, um, for being such a mentor, for being so gregarious and that charming and amazing self that you are uh i am so 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 happy to 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 be here celebrating you and um and yeah congratulations thank you milton yes i i hope the book will find a way to be uh translated and as well as to uh disseminated uh, the, you know, we need to explore things to get it to the grassroots. Maybe even we can connect with some people on the continent beyond Ethiopia, Ethiopia to start with, of course, and get parts of the excerpt read over some radio programs and just to read the masses. Because I want a young person who's faced with that type of discrimination to realize that you can actually turn it around to your advantage. And don't despair and don't give up hope. You can indeed turn it around and become like Dr. Muhammad, you know what I'm saying? Use those abuses, the insults, to bring out the best in you. So thank you for writing that book. And now let's maximize its potential. Thank you. Mamadou? Mamadou? Is Dr. Shimelis here? Oh, well, Shimelis left. left. That's why we had him earlier. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, ASG Zerahun? Okay. Thank All right. Um, I, this is Zerahun. Oh, yes. Final words. Thank you have 20 seconds. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for uh, uh, making you part of much uh, deserved tribute. Um, perhaps I, I have known Mohammed the longest, I dare say. Uh, and um, I thought, you know, uh, I had his number. I thought I knew him. But the book had opened my eyes uh, to a lot of things, uh, perhaps things which our youth uh, had obscured. Uh, and uh, I, um, uh, I would like to thank him again uh, for uh, making me a, a, a worthier friend now that I know more uh, than I did. And I relate uh, to, to many of the things that he has uh, so beautifully um, uh, written about. Uh, so as I said earlier, and many had also uh, this uh, Wets our appetite for the sequel, and and uh, 
we will we will have that uh, sooner than later. Thank you very much, and thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, uh, Ron, Dr. Daniels. But he left. Uh, he left. Yeah, he had. Okay, so um, final words from Nadia, Siham, and Safi. Um, before you go there, uh, Gordon, I, I, I kind of, I know Ron had to rush and leave, but, but I just want to uh, thank him. I know he was uh, pressed for time, but he uh, wouldn't miss this, and he made a, you know, an extraordinary effort to be here today. So I just want to thank him dearly for that. Of course, he's a... Uh, a comrade in arms and a friend, and I appreciate his words. Thank you. Okay, very good. And with that, I want to thank everyone one more time, and good luck. And you'll be getting the the information on how to purchase the book um, this evening. And go right ahead. Let's make it a bestseller. Thank you all. Goodbye. <laughs>